Let us bring them on the show, everybody. They we were going to talk mainly about Panquake and the importance of Panquake, and uh, we wanted to bring both of these gentlemen back on the show. They've both been on the show before. Um, first of all, uh, XCIA and whistleblower John Kiriaka was here. Who uh, let's bring him on the show. John, how are you? Hey, doing well. Thanks, Graham. Sorry to hear about YouTube, man. Not good. Well, dude, that's you know everybody that's I world. know. It's this like, is happening to everybody I know. It's awful. Sorry. It's, I know it's great. I mean, it's 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 insane. I mean, it's happened on YouTube. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I have several friends, and I'm sure you'd know people too. Worked at RT America, so they just basically wiped RT America off the face of the earth. <laughs> I yep. mean, like just like that. It's and all these really good shows, Redacted Tonight, On Contact, Boom Bust, uh, Max mm -hmm. Kaiser, all these shows that I watched um, that brought news and information to people in a way that the Amer American media isn't. It's just, it's awful. <laughs> Terrible. It's, we, we live, we live in, we live in a crazy, we live in crazy times. Um, but uh, we'll bring also on uh, the CSO of Panquake, who's been on the show before, Mr. Sean O'Brien. Sean, how you doing? Uh, great. Happy to be here. Excellent. Well, um, let's get right into it. Uh, about first of all where panquake is it's just i mean it's close to being done i've talked to Susie about it uh and then i want to really get into the importance of it especially to what we were just talking about john and i were just talking about and all the censorship all of us have seen um yeah. so why, why don't sean why don't you just give us sort of an update of where it's at and the status of it and then we'll get into the the reasons why Sure. So um, as a lot of your audience knows, Panquake.com is a short messaging service. Um, we've been um, working on it uh, from a development standpoint since approximately last summer. Um, and stuff is moving very, very quickly. The development process is going really fast. Um, we just revealed to the world um, the look and feel. So the uh, beautiful screens um, showing what a Panquake dashboard will look like, um, this environment that we want folks to um, be happy living in, um, expressing themselves, sharing information, you know, um, and having a network where they really can feel and know, actually, transparently, um, that they're reaching the folks that they intend to reach. They have the amplification they should have, that they have the voice that they should have uh, on social media. Um, so we have, uh, you know, a functioning uh, interface. Uh, John has seen it uh, and we have demoed it to some other folks as well. Um, we're constantly uh, building and adding to that um, and we're push, push, pushing. So we're in the last phase of our crowd fundraiser. Uh, so we're a crowdfunding model here. Um, we've had you know, approximately 3,500 folks uh, donate to that crowdfunder, which is just incredible. Um, and we need to get through this last phase, get across the goal line um, so we can bring the folks we need to bring in for things like support, um, making sure we have real humans and not algorithms, right, <laughs> um, who are going to help our folks, um, you know, if they if they need that, that support uh, in the network. Um, and just yeah, and, up in the business, really. Yeah. And just for people to look here, I've just put it, this is what the interface looks like. I've seen it as well. It's pretty amazing uh, to see how functional it is. And then to just go back to uh, this is how many people have donated thus far. This is the, the campaign. Uh, and this is to me already showing how hungry everybody is for this and, and what it's going to do. And it was really sort of exciting. Um, for, for me and for myself, for all of us to to see this, one of the things that I find exciting about it is that, um, you know, as a stand-up comedian, just as somebody that, that promotes shows, I've been so, um, you know, throttled that, that I, you know, I, I've amassed followers on all these social media platforms. And then I tell them, hey, I'm coming to your town to perform or watch my live stream or whatever. And they're like, never heard of it. They're not even allowed to hear of it. So it's really just uh, just as a performer, not to mention uh, all the other reasons for to use it for censorship. But um, I, I want to like, so John, what what drew you to this project and how do you see it? Yeah. Um, how, how do you see it 
interacting with the intelligence community, which which really has hijacked so many yeah. of these social media platforms. Really great questions. This is the best way to open this conversation. What what drew me was uh, several different things, actually. Um, number one, I've gotten to the point where I have to go to my Twitter every day to see if they've put a little red tag saying that I'm a, a an official mouthpiece of the Russian government, which I'm not. But I mean, poor Ed Schultz has been dead for how many years? And they made him a they put a tag on him saying that he's a mouthpiece of the Russian government. So that was one thing that bothers me very much. More importantly, though, you know, I I used to go to Twitter constantly to read the news. What what I would do is because I can't read everything as much as I would like to, I would follow people that I respect from a wide variety of backgrounds and look all day long to see what they're posting. What's Ralph Nader saying, right? What's uh, uh, the the Marshall uh, uh, Center saying or the Brennan Center or ProPublica? And now it's, you know, so much of what I used to be interested in is banned or it's, you, you can't see, you can't find Telesaur, you can't find RT or Sputnik. Uh, any anything that I'm interested in that has to do with prison reform, for example, uh, is deemed to be anti-American, and so all of a sudden I just can't read the news anymore. Facebook's even worse. Facebook beat Twitter to the punch. They're even worse. And then about a year ago, Susie Dawson approached me and told me about. Panquake. And the idea behind Panquake was no corporate money, no government money, no advertising, completely open source code so that everything is transparent. And I mean, like in the literal sense of the word, it's transparent. There is, there is no big brother to go through our, our uh, uh, posts and then impose an algorithm on us that's going to decide what our friends and followers can see and what they can't see. So, you know, we, we give a lot of, we give a lot of lip service, Graham, to, to freedom of speech and to transparency and nine times out of 10, at least here in the United States with these corporate run sites, we're just not serious about it. Well, what told me that, that Panquake was serious about it was the fact that it's hosted in Iceland, which I absolutely love. So it's not subject to a national security letter from the FBI demanding all of your user data and all this other nonsense that we see all the time in the news. And because there are no um, outside investors, no corporations or governments or think tanks or anything else, uh, there's no pressure to squelch free speech. So this, in my view, is what these big tech platforms originally thought they wanted to be and then realized that they could never be. Never. Yeah. And they've, I mean, you, you, especially you read a book like, uh, you know, when, when Google met WikiLeaks, uh, you know, you realize that like Google has been basically doing data collection for the intelligence community for quite a while. So it's absolutely, not even absolutely. You know, I remember, oh, it's been 10 or 12 years now when uh, somebody, I don't know who, somebody leaked to WikiLeaks that it wasn't just Google. It was literally every one of the big tech firms from, from Microsoft to Google, to Apple, to all the big communications companies, every last one of them was providing information to the CIA and to NSA and to the FBI with these national security letters. Well, you have to ask yourself, when the director of security for Microsoft is the former station chief, well, I shouldn't say where he was the station chief, but you know, there's a problem. There's a problem with this. How do we trust this company? Well, Pan yeah. I can trust. Yeah, and th that's the thing that's so fascinating to me is like in in uh, you know in in how Susie's explained it to me and to all of us. Like I'm I'm you know I'm not a coder, I'm not a tech guy at all, and so the questions that have come up, like um, 
and because Susie's been targeted herself and because she knew, right. like, knew Julian and, yes. and understands how this works, they put in, you guys have put in so much stuff to prevent yes. all of this, like yes. the Iceland thing. I never even would have thought of that, you know, like, and they, that the, the servers are not Amazon servers because that's boom. They can, they can just call up Amazon and say, shut it down and it's done. Yeah. And Jeff Bezos has got $600 million from the CIA. So we, yes. <laughs> We know we know where, where right. he's at. So um, I want to like uh, some of the questions and Sean, I, I know you can you can answer these. Um, the questions of like, can it be hacked? Can it be can can somebody just come in and buy Panquake and, and snatch up all your data? It is always all the data going to be stored somewhere so everyone can steal it or hack it or whatever. Can you can you answer those questions for anybody? Sure. Um, and first, I just want to say, you know, the points you're making and, and the, the way we're talking about this is absolutely correct, right? Um, we want to be a lifeboat away from big tech. And that's, you know, an analogy, of course, but it's a one we really, really mean. Um, protecting data is actually protecting lives, um, you know, especially when we're talking about, you know, high value targets for the CIA, et cetera, et cetera. Um, activists um, who are making an impact, right? They're, they know that they're being targeted. It has a real effect on their lives. And these other social media sites that are advertising, surveilling, you know, creating these frameworks, which work in turn work with these state agencies, um, they are exposing people to real harm and real danger. So um, that's exactly the thing that we care about, um, you know, protecting people from. And uh, that's why we're building things the way we're building them. So on the building piece. Um, so yeah, we have our core infrastructure in Iceland. Um, it's a good jurisdiction for you know freedom of speech and a number of other protections from um, specifically the US government, but other governments as well. Um, but also we have a decentralized model, right? We have a blockchain based model and our nodes, the machines, the people, right, with smartphones and desktop computers and so on, that will be in panquake.com, those folks will be communicating to each other using peer-to-peer -peer connections, right? So we're making sure we're using the edge of the network. We're having folks uh, communicate in a decentralized, not cloud computing way. Um, and that in turn makes a network very resilient against things like, you know, DDoSing and other kinds of attacks that could bring it down, right? Um, we spread out the computing as far as we possibly can. Um, we make sure we have strong encryption, strong, um, you know, authentication and verification of users between other users. And we have some clever encryption where we're uh, implementing to do all of that. Um, we make sure that uh, we have open source code, right? So we're going to release uh, with the uh, Panquake launch, we're going to release the code for the entire stack. Um, that means anybody can review and audit that. And we will have the best and brightest security experts and already do have quite a few um, looking at that work, looking at that code. Um, so that's our, sort of the fundamental things. But if you care about protecting data, right? Um, don't take that data in in the first place, okay? One of the analogies that um, a lot of security experts talk about is data as what they call a toxic asset. Um, and that means basically, you know, the more data you collect, the more you sort of put it on a shelf somewhere, it's like a corroding battery that just gets worse and worse and worse. These other services, right, that we're so used to using on the internet have these huge databases, these huge server farms that have all this information on their users, all these profiles and so on. Um, at Panquake, right, we don't want that data in the first place, okay? Anything that's even remotely sensitive will be on your machine. So we're architecting it so that you have a user data store on your devices, um, and that's your data. You own it. We don't want it. Um, so you're not even collecting the data. Right. That's right. That's exactly right. So Pretty you're cool, not going right? to. Be, you don't even. <laughs> have to use, it's incredible, right? Yeah, it's incredible. I love it. Yeah, but it's so simple, really. And, and you know, we're not going to collect email addresses or phone numbers or those kinds of things that folks are now having to use all the time to verify themselves on these other networks. 
we don't want it, right? Um, that's good for us, right? And it's good for you. Um, and that's that's the basic principle there. Um, the nuts and bolts of how it works. I mean, we're, we're taking some very clever pieces of software, some very clever encryption. Um, we're decentralizing and spreading things out like true peer-to-peer -peer networks. Um, we're doing a lot of the things which, you know, other transformative, you know, um, apps are doing um, to change the, the world. And this thing that some folks are starting to call web three right although we'll see if that catches on um but the point is you know it's about breaking down these control structures breaking down the centralization of the network environment that we have which is what allows the googles etc cetera, etc cetera, to have the censorship that they have but it also allows them right to basically ruin people's lives by amassing these huge profiles on people and then following them throughout their entire childhood now. I mean, the people who've grown up in this environment all the way through, you know, they hope that, you know, the end of their lives. That's that's the Google plan, right? Um, and that's something we not only would never do, we don't want to do it. Um, and because we're not focusing on spying on people, right? Like these other companies are, and they put all this engineering effort into trying to figure out who people are and who they're talking to and how to stop them from talking to specific people or stop them from sharing different information. That takes a lot of engineering work, right? Um, because we're not doing all that, we can use our engineering muscle, right? To deliver something different that allows information to be amplified freely, allows you to reach your audience and know verifiably and transparently with the blockchain record that you're reaching your audience and so on and so forth. Um, it, it's, it's simple, right? <laughs> it's, it's in some ways going back to, you know, the better parts of the internet before it was destroyed in the last, you know, 10, 15, 20 years by these big tech companies. And we're using the lessons and the cool technology that's out now to reinvent that internet into something that's better and more powerful. So, well, that's, yeah, that, that's got to have them all befuddled because you're not creating something to try to take over the world and become billionaires and build rocket ships to fly away from a planet that you let set on fire. Um, so I wanted to, and since we've all seen, we've all seen, you know, how they've used infiltrated social media, like the intelligence and stuff to, to blow up activist movements. There's, you see these infiltrators, you know, they'll have a pro a profile that, you know, you look to read the profile, boy, they seem like they're a real true lefty activist. It says free Assange and Medicare for all or whatever else. And then they're always like stirring shit up or whatever. Um, so I wanted to, Sean, quickly tell us like, how that works in terms of the the pan, giving someone a panquake and giving them the authority to do that so that even because 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 the question is like okay so you guys are doing five dollars a month subscription what's to prevent google or the cia or whomever to buy a bunch of bot accounts and then they can just take this thing over and in six months to a year it'll be ruined again just like the last cool thing we thought was going to be great that's now ruined <laughs> Sure, sure. Um, so there's a few mechanisms that we're sort of building in at a fundamental level. We'll obviously also have checks and balances, uh, you know, um, intrusion det detection systems and so on so that we can start spotting, you know, real attacks on the network. But putting aside that technical stuff, um, first off, the subscriber model is a good way to limit um, things like botnets, like all these bots, um, you know, swarming and, and creating these, you know, what used to be called egg accounts on Twitter, right? These these BS accounts with 30 followers that just harass people and, and make people's lives miserable. Um, that subscription actually does help to limit that somewhat. Um, you know, the types of tools that, you know, the CIA, the NSA uses to spin up these fake personas, as they call them in their own documents, um, that is not going to be easy to do um, when you have a subscription model. So that's that's sort of the first thing, right? The and I guess you really, if they want to buy a bunch of bots, well, that's thanks for the five bucks from all these robots, right? I guess that's so. one way to think about it. Do they really want to be funding us, right? Um, so at any rate, um, the second part is that um, it's an opt-in social network in the sense that you're going to see content from the people you follow or content, for example, that you might search for. So if you search for cats, you're gonna see cats, right? Um, that's not a, a very effective network for spies to use to amplify content and manipulate 
people, right? Um, because what they rely upon is spinning up these, you know, groups of fake accounts so that they can basically push their narratives so that they can have, you know, these fake trawling conversations, shove things into people's timelines, manipulate um, on the back end when they can the algorithm to silence some voices and to uh, allow some other voices to be bigger so that their voices, the bots that they control, the paid staff that they pay to manipulate social feeds, those folks suddenly have a huge voice in these big tech networks, right? None of that's going to be possible in Panquake. Um, folks have a, a level playing field, which is very big to us. And it's not just about, you know, the spies and, and all of that, which certainly is a problem that we're well, well aware of. Um, but we want to be somebody who's, you know, just um, starting out uh, trying to promote content such as yourself, Graham. I mean, you're not just starting out, but you would be when you get into Panquake new mm -hmm. there. Um, we want you to have equal footing to, you know, if, I don't know, somebody who was uh, some huge star came into the network, right? Um, we want to know that those accounts start out um, on equal footing, have the ability to amplify, have the ability to reach their followers. And folks will find that they have a voice that where they don't feel like they're, you know, in some sort of popularity contest. Right. Um, a lot of that, again, is just about not manipulating timelines, right? Not manipulating right. content, not forcing fake trends into people's faces that are advertising the next Disney thing. Um, we're not doing any of that. But that that also makes it so that a lot of the abuse, a lot of the things that Facebook especially has been called out for um, can't happen in the network. Um, if you're not manipulating algorithms, you know, to do this terrible stuff to do, you know, manipulation of uh, political beliefs for, you know, some sort of political campaign and so on and so forth. Um, then, you know, uh, there's there's a lot less to worry about as far as folks who are worried about, you know, these kinds of, uh, um, I don't know, these social uh, uh, engineers, let's say. Right. Uh, if we get us, you know, a, a someone in there who is trying to manipulate people, they're going to find it's going to be very, very difficult with the way that we're just having opt-in content, no tre trend manipulation, no timeline manipulation, and honest transparency about statistics. Um, that alone is going to make it really hard for these folks to operate the way that they're used to operating in the big tech environment. So. Yeah, and so let me, let me ask you this, John. So, like, you've obviously experienced firsthand the targeting for being a whistleblower. You've seen it. You know, the Assange movement and the WikiLeaks has been targeted. I mean, Susie Dawson just put in the chat how they shut down the PayPal donations during the yeah. fundraising of this. They and did. so how do you, what, what ta I mean, like, we have to think in these terms, and this is the thing I liked in the conversations I had with Susie, is she's assuming these attacks are going to come. She's not like, yeah. let's hope they play nice. We know they're not going to play nice. We know what they're going to do. So what attack, what things do you see them trying to do to shut down Panquake, John? And how do you see Panquake being able to with, withstand these attacks? Um, yeah, you know, I'm confident that Susie and Sean and the team have foreseen uh, a lot of what uh, we ought to be expecting. Basing, basing the, the servers in Iceland, I think, was a, a stroke of genius. Even the corporate headquarters is um, is offshore in, in a in a place that's very secure for this kind of thing. Uh, very very forward thinking. Um, if I were still at the CIA or NSA, I would be looking for a technical way in. I think that the fact that uh, there's this subscription service, which makes it almost impossible to create bots to attack the system, unless the bots pay you know, the $5 a month was also uh, brilliant. Uh, what the CIA, well, I would expect different things from the CIA and from NSA. NSA, I would expect technical attacks. And Bill Benny, Bill Benny's on the team. Bill can go into some deep detail on that kind of thing. He's, he's a genius. Uh, on the CIA side, I would expect um, a different kind of underhandedness. I would expect uh, personal attacks on Panquake's leadership. I would, I would expect um, uh, articles uh, condemning all of us who are involved for whatever reason. Oh, John Kiriakou, he's a convicted felon. You wanna be in business with a convicted felon? You know, I get that all the time from people who can't debate on the issues. So, uh, you know, what they did to, to WikiLeaks 
uh, allowed us to learn lessons and we've been able to safeguard ourselves, to protect ourselves from those kinds of attacks. It's going to be much, much harder to attack Panquake than it is to attack WikiLeaks. And because Panquake is still so small, it's still, you know, in its nascent stages, I think we largely haven't come to their attention yet. And I'm, I'm optimistic that once we do come to their attention, once we're big enough or important enough to be worth attacking, we'll be so ready for them that there won't be anything that they can do. Well, yeah, I mean, it will get, I can't wait for the article that Pantenquake is helping Putin or whatever. whatever that, exactly. that, 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 you know it's coming. You know yeah, it's Putin. coming. They're going to hashtag Putin sure. quake or whatever. Right. Like, Putin quake. Great. Yeah. <laughs> just like just like Ed Snowden defected to Russia. Like right. nobody in America remembers that he was in the transit lounge when John Kerry revoked his passport. Right. So, yeah, histories change as time passes. It's going to be up to us to make sure that the truth is out there. Which, again, Panquake will afford us that safe place to do it. And, and I want people to understand that this wasn't just like something slapped together. You've got Bill Benny involved, NSA wow. whistleblower. John, you're a CIA whistleblower involved. You've got Susie who's been targeted. You've got people who've played this game and see the, tra the tactics. And so, yeah. you know, let's all just be ready for the whatever Panquake kills puppies headline from CNN or whatever, whatever, whatever. Exactly. That's how you know you're making an impact, right? Um, yeah. How, how else are you going to attack the former number four at NSA, NSA's technical director, who's arguably one of the, the greatest minds in America on the issue of internet security and privacy? How else are you going to attack him? Right. right. Yeah, right. you've got to say he 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 killed Christmas or whatever. You exactly. Like it. Bill, <laughs> Bill Benny hates rainbows or whatever they're gonna whatever they're gonna say. Um, so um, and I, the thing too, I want and I want I want to talk about this as well because uh, Susie, one of the things our conversation her and I had was about she wants to be ready to have staff in place so that if it takes off, mm -hmm. it's not overwhelmed. Cause that's another thing too. We mm -hmm. get all of a sudden, you know, 2 million people sign up for this thing in, in, in 20 days. Oh, we're, we don't, we don't know how, we don't have the staff in place to do that. So what, what steps are you guys taking in case that, which is a, which would be a good problem to have um, for that to, to be handled. So we have a staggered release model, right? Um, so first, I just want to say, you know, if, if you folks uh, are interested in our progress and how we're building and, and the direction we're moving in and why we're making certain choices and so on, we do monthly delivery meetings um, where we recap basically everything that happened in the month, both the technical stuff and the non-technical. Um, and we just make sure we have that transparency for all of our donors and, and the public in general. Um, but yeah, uh, we do staggered releases basically. So uh, first off, uh, we are having a beta, right? And that beta will have 5,000 users in it. Um, if folks would like to apply to potentially be someone who can join the beta, um, you can go out to panquake.com. There's a link to apply to join the beta. We just wanna make sure we do a little bit of vetting and, and we don't have bots swarming us at the beginning, uh, right? Yeah. So that's the kind of thing we're, we're being smart about. And, and that, that model is very smart. Um, that way um and not just bots but you know disruptive folks and so on. we want to have we like disruptive folks of a certain kind but <laughs> we we want to have trustworthy folks in the network who really care about what we're doing and and uh and so on and so forth that's a smart thing to do and then we go to the 1.1 1 .1, um and we're going to get to uh 25,000 users for that release um so we're just having just a little bit larger for that and then we will open it to the public and have sort of this staggered release model that allows us to make sure, especially with a blockchain, right? We have to have that core of trust in the beginning. Um, the folks who are a part of what's called a consensus model and, and uh, your audience who are cryptocurrency folks, I'm sure are familiar with this kind of thing. Um, you need to make sure that that core is uh, non-malicious actors, basically. Um, so we have to have that really trusted core of folks in the beginning. Um, and then we just sort of move out and, and branch out. The um, support plan, which is something that the staff is working on um, in which I'm sure we will uh, 
uh, talk about this month in the delivery meeting and probably continue to talk about um, is very smart. Um, we're making sure that we're scaling or planning to scale, you know, having real humans who can help real people and um, doing that and making sure that's in place, giving people that different experience from, you know, all this algorithmic, um, you know, BS that they're used to um, is, is also really important to us, right? Um, we want people to be respected. We're building respect in not just into the technology, right, but also into the way that we're building the infrastructure around that, the human infrastructure around that. Um, so that's that's really a big part of it. But also, I will say, like this decentralization stuff, right, um, which has already changed the world with you know cryptocurrency and and some other decentralized apps that are out there, D apps or whatever folks want to call it. Um, it's really powerful. It's really scalable. Um, so we can plan sort of a staging of bringing more and more nodes online, expanding the network out across continents and so on and so forth. Um, we're using the pipe in very efficient ways, so to speak, right? We're not just funneling a bunch of data into a Google data center somewhere or relying upon some Amazon AWS server that we're renting, you know, that's not even ours. And um, that kind of thing allows us to really plan in a smart way. Um, we don't want to be like some of these networks that folks may be familiar with, the, the Getters, which had, you know, Getter had all kinds of problems, to put it mildly. Um, Truth Social, the, the Trump network that seems to have fallen apart before it started, barely. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing are the mistakes that we know well, are well aware of, and we can make sure that we don't do. Um, but also, I mean, look, we want to have uh, uh, something sustainable here. Um, we're not trying to, as, as we said, you know, have uh, VC money or corporate PR teams. Mm. We don't have corporate marketing teams. Everything we've raised to this point is gra grassroots money um, from folks who are donating their hard earned cash to us to do something amazing. Um, and that's been done, you know, with word of mouth. Our word of mouth and speaking to each other, human to human, is really, really powerful. Um, so we have regular people being our voice. We're going to get that critical mass. And when we get there, right, we get those folks on board and we can't be ignored by the corporations and these other folks. You know, that's when you'll see the smear pieces, certainly. But that's also when you're going to see a situation where we can't be ignored and we're on the front pages, right? Um, you have to build it that way. And that, that's a lesson, really, that, uh, you know, we learned in, in some respect from uh, from WikiLeaks, right? Um, they built something that couldn't be ignored there. Um, they were releasing information that was vitally, you know, important um, and did it in such a, a clever way, especially with, I mean, with the numerous releases that they did, um, that, you know, even though the mainstream media didn't want to report this stuff, they had to. Right. And um, mm -hmm. that's sort of the thing that we're learning and trying to do with Panquake as well. We want to be something big that people care about, that people are part of real ordinary folks. And then, you know, um, conquer the world. <laughs> Let's hope. We'll see. Um, uh, so re real quick, folks, if you're watching and you want to ask any direct questions, go to rockman.com slash Graham Elwood. If you do the tip, I will answer those questions. So, um, John, John. Uh, as we're, you know, it, it's great hearing this tiered um, release um, or staggered release, as it was called, and knowing again, was, as you just brought up, what the tactics, you know, this NSA and the CIA, what the tactics would be, you know, when Panquake becomes this bigger thing that they'll take notice of once it's a threat that they can't they can't disrupt it in, in the traditional ways. How do you see this potentially changing? just the landscape of freedom of speech, because we're in a country now <clears throat> that is not a democracy. If you're shutting down RT, that's right. it, not a democracy. I mean, that's a, so then they should be able to, if, if you don't like what they're saying, well, then are we going to shut down Fox News next? I don't like, I don't, I don't agree with Fox News. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with MSNBC. Do we shut them down? I mean, so, uh, cause you know, like I said, I've been, I've been demonetized for 15 months now and yeah. I'm a comedian in my, in an apartment, you know what I mean? T -t Talking about, uh, you know, what's wrong with this country and, I, how, and I'm a threat. I'm a threat. I'm a comedian who, who talks about surfing and Batman is also a threat. Like this is yeah. just maddening to me. So how do, how do you see? Yeah. This is why the prosecution of Julian Assange is so dangerous. That, that this exactly is the reason why 
Julian's case is such a slippery slope because you use the uh, the Espionage Act to prosecute a journalist. And even if you don't believe that he's a journalist, which I do, you can't deny that he's a publisher. And so if he's convicted under the Espionage Act, then what's to keep the Washington Post national security reporter from being convicted or the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, whoever in the White House, it happens to be in the White House if he doesn't like something that's been written and there's one little kernel of information that, you know, may or may not be legitimately classified, what's to keep the White House from going after that next person? So we're we're all in danger. You're You're exactly right, Graham, that we're not in a democracy. If we were in a democracy, we as adults would be able to choose the sources uh, of news that we want to consume. And we just simply can't do that. I can't go anymore to press TV to get the Iranian side of a story or to Telesaur or to RT America. I can't even go to Al Jazeera America. It doesn't even exist anymore. So this is something that is going to, I think, open a, a, a path that had been closed or has been closed uh, to us. Uh, this is this is McCarthyism all over again. I, I hate speaking in hyperbole, but I really don't believe this is hyperbole. It's dangerous. You know, this is another thing. And forgive me for getting on a soapbox, but when I was um, when I was assigned to the State Department for a few years, I was the human rights officer, and I had to I had to write the human rights report every year for the country that I was assigned to. I was in Bahrain, and uh, and send it to Congress. And I used to say, you know, we we profess to be this shining beacon of hope for democracy and civil rights and human rights and civil liberties. And it's bullshit. You know, what what would a host country think, for example, when John Kiriakou, the human rights guy, goes into the minister of interior's office and says, your excellency, I have to warn you, you're your men beat this 15 year old boy to death the other day because he marched in a pro-democracy demonstration that is illegal. It's an extra judicial killing. And I'm going to put it in the human rights report. And then 15 minutes later, the CIA station chief walks in and says, don't listen to the human rights guy. We want you to open a secret prison here where we can bring people to be tortured. Don't tell anybody. And we're going to give you $50 million dollars to cover the costs and grease the right palms. Well, it's the same thing with information. We say one thing and then we do the completely opposite thing. This is an antidote to that. It's an antidote because it's based overseas. It is utterly and completely transparent and will pr we'll protect the system. The system will protect itself. Mm -hmm. So people really can have a free exchange of ideas, something that just simply doesn't exist on Twitter, on Facebook, on YouTube, or on any of these other uh, platforms. Not anymore. And, yeah. and something I, I just want to make sure I add there too, you know, we talk about the Espionage Act, right? And how atrocious it is that's being used in this way. Look, um, Julian's not an American citizen, right? right. Um, so this makes it more dangerous. It's it's unreal, right? So it just goes to show the danger of you know real power in these situations. Um, we at Panquake we not only understand these kinds of things, but we take it, our role seriously as an international presence, right? Yeah. We're not going to be doing the bidding of some government based upon some government thing, right? We really want to have an information system that has free flow of information all over the world between you know, anybody who wants to connect to anybody else using our network. And that's the thing that really um, is sacrosanct about the model we're trying to build. Um, you know, so I, I founded something called Privacy Lab at Yale. That's part of something called the Information Society Project. It's called that because we have an information society, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we need to take seriously the role of free flow of information and how vital that is to a democracy 
if we're going to have a democracy, but also if we're just going to have normal conversations between, you know, uh, as friends, as family, um, without this intense polarization and animosity that's been brewing. Um, all of that manipulation, all of that that's happened has a lot to do with the locking down of the information system. Some of that is for private data brokers who want to spy on us and ostensibly sell us things, right? Some of that is from these, you know, uh, government spies and agencies which are working in tandem with the private, you know, um, entities. And some of that are folks who are very powerful, who are trying to push propaganda, push control of populations, shut down movements, shut down activists, shut down anybody who has an impact that goes against their you know, plans and schemes. And, um, you know, the role that something like pancrake.com can play in opening up that information system can't be, you know, uh, uh, overstated. Um, it is uh, absolutely incredible what can happen when we are allowed to speak to each other, when we are allowed to make our own decisions based upon varying information instead of being sold some lines, some propaganda. So... How much do you think, as we wrap up here, because I know you guys got to go, I know you've been doing interviews all day and I appreciate your time. Um, how how much is the the like the Bitcoin white paper, did it influence the uh, formulation of Panquake? <laughs> That's a general question, sure. So um, I, I love that you say we, we don't have that much time left and then give me that now. <laughs> and then give me this just ma massive, like, there's, there's no way to answer this question in less than 10 minutes. But no, no, it's fine. We're not uh, pressed for time. I'm just respecting. I know you guys are busy, but so, answer how you want to answer. So what blockchain technology represents is a really clever way, right, of verifying information, re reaching consensus so that you can have machines talk to each other without central authority, right? Um, so in the sense where Bitcoin does accomplish that, although a lot of it, of course, has been centralized in exchanges and so on and so forth, um, but in the sense where it does accomplish that, that's similar to what we're trying to do um, with Panquake. Now, we care about free flow of information and content and so on. So we have a content uh, based blockchain, right? Um, but we can have nodes in the network reach consensus and verify that, hey, you know, John sent a quake, quake is what we're calling our short messages, um, and be able to say, hey, this belongs on the blockchain, John's a verified, you know, Panquake user, and then commit that to the blockchain record. That blockchain is basically a ledger or a spreadsheet, however you want to think of it, um, that can then be shared and broadcast around the world to all these other machines on the network. Um, unlike the model where, you know, you have a big tech company that has some database somewhere in some unknown location, and they can just tweak and modify and change it, uh, literally rewriting history. Right, which we we see, or ban somebody and just everything goes poof, right? Um, unless it's been archived and so on and so forth. That's something else I should bring up, I guess, just real quickly. We take very seriously, um, you know, the archiving of information as well. Um, we want to solve in some way the thing that's called bit rot, right? We want to make sure that people can not only share information, but that the information that they're sharing on Panquake will be resilient to um, censorship itself. And we have some clever things we're working on from that standpoint too. Um, we want to make sure if you share an article from something like Al Jazeera English or, or some other thing that's being blocked, banned, or disappears, um, that there's some permanence of the information you're sharing in our network too. Um, so we're working on that. All right. Well, <laughs> I mean, this is, uh, I really appreciate your time and where can people go to support this? Uh, pancrake.com slash donate. Um, you also can go pancrake.com slash crypto to donate cryptocurrency. Um, we also have a sub stack, uh, Talk Liberation, um, which is not paywalled. But if you do subscribe, your money for subscribing, $5 a month, um, goes towards uh, the Panquake build, all of that money. Um, those are the ways you can support us. But the other thing is we need you as regular people to be our media. So far, that's how we've succeeded. And if you can help amplify us, talk about us, um, share some of our videos, um, share this stream, please. You know, um, that's the way that we're going to win. That's the way that we're going to get there. So. Amen. Right on. Thank you for, thank you, especially, you know, 
for doing this, taking the time, and especially in light of what just happened with the Julian ruling, it's it's like like John said, it's important now more than ever. So, um, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, John Kiriakou Thank and you, John Brian. Thanks a lot. Guys. Have a great day. You too. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. We are still in our like ninth month of demonetization from YouTube. So support what we're doing at patreon.com slash Graham Elwood or rockfin.com slash Graham Elwood, which is a blockchain cryptocurrency platform. It's free to sign up and there's a premium level at $10 a month. And for that, you get everybody on the platform's premium content. Myself, Lee Camp, Ron Placone, Jimmy Dore, Whitney Webb, Kim Iverson, Abby Martin, and many, many others. You can also support what we're doing at Venmo at Graham Elwood and go to GrahamElwood.com. We have a PayPal button and a PO box. I also have crypto wallets, which are all in the show notes. Thanks for supporting what we do.